So I'd love to introduce to you Dr. John McNaught. He is the medical director at Fertility Ontario here in London, Ontario. He's extremely passionate about his career and he loves helping people build their families. Dr. John McNaught is extremely active in his social media channels and on his website, and he always strives to bring more education around important fertility topics. So without further ado, welcome, John. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for coming, everybody, and we're going to get right into it. Um, this is a topic that I have become an expert in um, kind of by circumstance. I started off as in... Um, developing expertise in more, I guess what people call advanced fertility techniques like IVF. Um, and what I've learned over the years is that there is no solution that works for everybody. And in a lot of cases, what we will do is go back to what the body is capable of all on its own and rely on the body's ability to heal itself and, and organize its own function. And in, it's been in those cases where we use less medication and more natural methods that we've had some of our biggest successes. So I'd like to bring that philosophy to you today. Um, obviously, there are many definitions of what you would call natural fertility therapy. I'm going to present to you sort of, you know, my brand of this particular um, medical therapy. There are many different things that you can use in order to enhance natural fertility. I tend to use a very simple, very streamlined approach and I know that a lot of other people will use you know multiple different supplements or herbals or techniques as part of their natural fertility practices and you know there, there isn't one recipe that works for everybody. All I'm going to do to tonight is present the basics and present my approach. Um, what's going to be missing from tonight's talk, which I think comes up very often in my discussion with patients, is the subject of acupuncture. I think it fits in very nicely to the treatment of fertility through natural methods. But it's such an um, encompassing topic that it probably deserves its own webinar. So at some point, we'll have one of the specialists who provides acupuncture therapy for us come on and explain the benefits of acupuncture for patients going through fertility therapy. And I think it would be a disservice to me to try to explain something I don't properly understand. So tonight, we're going to talk about natural methods. And specifically, you should be asking your, yourself the question, can I benefit from natural fertility therapy? And we'll go over some of the indications for the therapy and times when you might not get as much benefit from it. Um, it's never a bad idea to go back to very basic biology, something I know that a lot of patients um, spend a lot of time tracking. We'll go over that briefly only to remind ourselves how unpredictable and erratic real life can be. Um, we're going to talk about sex, um, sperm quality, and, and how to try to maintain intimacy and spontaneity in sexual relationships while you're going through natural therapy. Finally, in terms of treatment, I want to talk about some of the vitamins, antioxidants, and supplements that I use and then move on to a special case, um, an area where I prescribe natural fertility therapy quite a bit, and that's in patients who have decreased ovarian reserve. Um, and people who have lower egg counts or decreased ovarian reserve have become one of the largest populations that receive natural fertility therapy through my clinic. So Natural fertility therapy is, you know, is typically home-based therapy that focuses on intercourse for fertilization. And of course, I realize that not all of my patients are heterosexual couples. When we describe the therapy, it, it does sort of lend itself to heterosexual intercourse at home. But you can take a lot of the principles from it and apply it to really any type of fertility therapy. So it's, it's very much inclusive regardless of um, your situation. One of the 
tenets of it is that it involves very few prescription medications or sometimes none at all. It's generally very safe and very inexpensive. Um, in particular in comparison to some of the other therapies that we provide. And it's, it's, it, it's a principle more than a prescription. So you can take the knowledge from the natural fertility program and apply it to more advanced techniques. So if you're going through donor insemination or intrauterine insemination, IVF or even ICSI, the therapies of, of the natural fertility program or their, the principles rather, apply quite nicely in those situations as well. So who can benefit from it? It's very tempting to say everybody, but I think we need to be realistic about the things that keep us from achieving healthy pregnancies. The answer is very different for everybody. The, you know, there's a multitude of reasons why so many people are having difficulty achieving a family these days and because there are so many different reasons there need to be a variety of different therapies so natural fertility therapy can't be a universal solution I think it applies to a huge number of people but we do have to remind ourselves that there are situations where realistically other techniques are going to be of more benefit. So in the extreme, you know, the patient with blocked fallopian tubes, the male patient with extremely low sperm counts, or people with severe endometriosis, natural fertility therapy is not going to be as effective, and we do have other treatments that, that hold more promise. But by and large, there is a huge catchment in terms of those that are candidates for this therapy. It's useful in both women who have normal ovarian reserve and women who have decreased ovarian reserve. Um, in terms of men, as long as the sperm counts are reasonable, there is a huge um, potential upside to natural fertility therapy. And we say normal fallopian tube function, which means at least one of them needs to be open and functioning in order for this method to work. If only one fallopian tube is open, the time to pregnancy is typically longer. So it's not impossible, but you need to sort of reset your expectations for a longer haul. And lastly, and most importantly, motivated patients can benefit from this therapy. Um, it is safer, it is more natural, it's less expensive, but typically it is not as, as quick as some of the more advanced fertility therapies. So you need to believe that it can work, you need to be patient, and you need to buy into the philosophy. And if you can do that, you can be one of the many people that this technique will work for. So we're going to talk about, again, basic biology, something that I know everyone has made sort of an expert of themselves in these days, but I, I always like to go back to it just because it's a reminder of how unpredictable so-called basic biology can be. On the right is a graph that I think many people have seen and it's the typical 28-day cycle. So the 28-day cycle split into two phases, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. Um, the follicular phase I always say is variable often takes you know a different number of days for the egg to grow to maturity in different patients the luteal phase or the supportive phase between ovulation and, and menstruation or implantation is supposed to be relatively fixed at about 12 to 14 days but again we see variability in that as well the graph on the right is seldom seen in real life um, because of the tremendous variability in the, the w different ways that people ovulate or in the different lengths of um, luteal phase that they have this graph doesn't apply to that many people but this is what your ovulation predictor kits are based on if you have an app on your iPhone 
if you have a website that you're consulting, they're typically assuming that you fall into this very rigid paradigm. And what a lot of you are finding in real life is that the cycle is not 28 days, it's 21 days, it's 36 days. And you know, you have to adjust your expectations of biology to your individual reality. One of the things that, that you also notice is that this cycle seems to have a start and a stop. And in real life, similarly, that is not the case. Follicles, ovarian follicles, are in constant production. So just as you're ovulating this month's group, you're actually, actually already preparing next month's group. So the things that you do, either through medications or through natural fertility therapy, tend to affect multiple groups of eggs at one time. And that's a concept that we often forget. The one last thing I'm going to say about this graph is in terms of levels of estrogen and progesterone, I, I want to remind people that estrogen and progesterone are the products and not the fuel. Okay, so a lot of people will say I'm low in estrogen or I'm low in progesterone. And that doesn't really make sense. Estrogen is produced by the development of a mature follicle and progesterone is produced after ovulation by the remnant of ovulation called the corpus luteum. So if you, you know, if you change your philosophy to say I could grow a more mature follicle or my corpus luteum function could be better, I think that's more accurate than saying I'm low in estrogen or I'm low in progesterone. So we're going to talk very briefly about this concept of the fertile window. If you're patients of mine, you, you know that I don't really believe that the fertile window exists. Um, it, from a statistical standpoint, there is a most optimal time to become pregnant. Um, it really isn't 48 hours, even though it, it's, it's touted to be that it, when you buy um, things like LH kits or apps for your iPhone. The fertile window is a lot larger than most people give it credit for. Um, and it tends to be prior to ovulation. So when I'm counseling people about intercourse, one of, the, one of the most common mistakes that I see people make is that they wait until ovulation has occurred in order to start intercourse. And at that point, they've missed a lot of their most fertile opportunities. So what I advise people is, as soon as the menstrual bleeding is out of the way, start intercourse early and have it often. And we'll talk about the definition of often a little bit later in the talk. The reason for this is that everyone ovulates at a different time. In patients who are older or in patients who have decreased ovarian reserve, we often see that the body's basal tone to, to stimulate egg development is higher and that will lead to a mature follicle at an earlier time in the cycle than your typical 14 days. So if those patients wait until day 14 to start sexual activity, they will often have missed their so-called fertile window. Much better to have fairly frequent intercourse before, during, and after ovulation. That way you cover all your bases. In terms of timing of the LH surge, I'm not totally opposed to this idea. I just think that people rely on this method a little bit too much. Um, you'll, you know, will have heard me say to people, throw out your calendars, throw out your kits, um, you know, basically stop monitoring. That's advice I give to a lot of people who are just too stressed out by the whole charting and monitoring, temperature taking, that they you know, it's become all-encompassing for them. So oftentimes, one of the first things I'll prescribe for people is a break from monitoring. 
just to sort of let them, you know, listen to their body a little bit rather than constantly writing down numbers. I, I really don't believe that the exact timing of the LH surge is important. More important is whether or not you ovulate. So the when is not really the issue, but the qualitative fact of do you ovulate or not in a given month is very important. Most people these days will use an LH kit in order to detect their ovulation, but if you practice, you can get accustomed to the signs that your body gives you that tell you that you're ovulating. Um, one of the most accurate is changes in cervical mucus, and that's been shown to be every bit as effective as the um, commercially available LH kits. A lot of my patients aren't able to use this method. They just really can't um, tell the changes in their cervical mucus, so they go with the store-bought approach. But once you get used to it, cervical mucus changes are, are some of the most accurate biological indicators that ovulation is occurring. So the other half of the equation, of course, is the luteal phase. And a lot of people will document ovulation. And, you know, even in the clinic we'll have, you know, very good objective evidence that a lady has ovulated. And we'll still see that the time between ovulation and menstruation is quite short. And oftentimes that will make the suggestion of what's called a luteal phase defect or a shortened luteal phase. In that instance, what we'll often do is prescribe supplemental progesterone, you know, in the thinking that, well, if the body can't make progesterone on its own, we'll give some back into the system in order to try to allow for implantation to occur. In, you know, sort of a retrospective, though, much better to improve the quality of the follicle that is ovulated. And then if you have a, a better corpus luteum generated, luteal phase should be improved on that basis. So even though we will go to the pharmacologic route of supplementing progesterone, you need to get at the root problem, which is basic ovarian function, if you really want to optimize both the follicular and the luteal phase. Okay, are there any questions about the um, the biology basics before we move on? We do actually have a question here from Julie. So Julie says, I was diagnosed with an atopic pregnancy three weeks ago and was treated with two cycles of methotrexate. Yeah. Not that long. The first week and again the second week. How soon can I resume DHEA, total fertility, and maternal vitamins after being treated? You can resume vitamin therapy right away. And one of the um, main reasons to resume vitamin therapy is to get your folate levels back up. Methotrexate is a very mild uh, chemotherapeutic agent, but unfortunately it can knock out your folic acid stores. One of the reasons we advise people not to get pregnant until three months after methotrexate therapy is to give the body a chance to build folic acid stores back up. I gotta tell you, it, it would not be a huge calamity if a patient got pregnant quickly after receiving methotrexate therapy. It's just not advisable. Um, having sufficient folic acid stores is very important in terms of the prevention of neural tube defects. So we really advise people to try and build their stores back up before attempting pregnancy again. Great. And we have another question here. Um, so this question is, if my luteal phase is usually only 12 days long, would you still recommend supplemental progesterone treatment? You know, that's that's um, a very subjective question. It, it, it depends on how we feel about the other qualitative aspects of the cycle. Um, 
if we really like the follicular phase and we feel that um, you know the, the patient is you know has a qualitatively vigorous ovulation really good parameters nice follicle size um, if they ovulate spontaneously and there doesn't seem to be a um, huge issue with the growth of a mature follicle there isn't any doubt inside to um, supplemental progesterone it's safe it's relatively cheap um, it's a bit of a nuisance to take on a continuous basis but um, we do prescribe it fairly often the only downside to taking supplement, supplemental progesterone is that it tends to delay the onset of the next natural menstrual cycle so often it can lead to a mismatch between the growth of the early follicles and the onset of menstruation so it becomes a little bit hard to, to monitor things. Um, we use it quite commonly and um, it's just sort of it's a gestalt thing where if you think um, there's a role for it then there's potential benefit. Got it. Got it. We have a few more questions coming in here. This question is from Kim. She says, can you tell us when the cervical mucus shows up? Is it during, before, or after ovulation? It's actually pretty variable, but it's usually um, a little bit closer to the actual act of ovulation than an LH kit will show up. Um, but yeah, it can be before, during, or after. It, um, it it's it's somewhat variable just because it's an excretion but it's a very reliable sign of ovulation I think you know that particular question gets back to the the fact that people are really obsessed with the timing of ovulation and I always go back to to, to really coaching people not to be concerned about that if it's whether or not the event occurs and not when and so you're much better to have um, you know sperm in the system on both ends of that phenomenon so that you're you really are you know sort of increasing the number of sperm that are at the target which is a healthy egg um, so the precise association between the increase in cervical mucus and the time of ovulation is variable and the important thing is not to worry about it just take that information to tell you that you are ovulating and really don't, you know, you, you need to disconnect from when ovulation occurs. Mm, good advice. We've got a question here from, this question is from Patricia. How do I find out if my tubes are functioning? They were mistakenly clipped and then I had the clips removed and my mucus, I, sorry, I'm going to say that again. They were mistakenly clipped and then I had the clips removed. My mucus has changed. Does that indicate I am fertile? Would that suggest I have tubal issues? Um, my previous gynecologist said she tried to repair the tube. Um, so I think she's just trying to figure out, she, she ends with, how do, I, how do I find out if I'm having tubal issues? Yeah, so that, you know, that's an excellent question. Um, kind of gets back to the concept of, you know, who can benefit from natural fertility therapy and who can't. If you have a previous tubal surgery, the chance of you having long-lasting tubal damage is fairly high. So at that point, you need to get your fallopian tubes assessed. And, and there are certain medical issues that you can't just leave unresolved. You have to answer that question for yourself. How you would do that is there's a number of different methods. Um, personally, I used an, an ultrasound-based technique called sonohysterography. Other people will use a more old-fashioned technique called a hysterosalpingogram, which is done by x-ray. And then finally, some people will use a laparoscopic procedure, um, which is a camera-based surgical technique. I think that's, that's a bit invasive as a first test, but sometimes in some areas that's all that's available. Um, a good quality uh, sonohistogram will tell you whether or not the fallopian tubes are open there's really no physiologic sign of tubal patency. Your body won't be able to give you that information. It's something that needs to be determined medically. Got it. Um, this question is from Sylvia. She says, other than a short luteal phase, what other conditions would lead a doctor to prescribe progesterone supplements? Uh, we do it in recurrent pregnancy loss. We do it in people um, 
who have undergone um, assisted reproductive techniques, sometimes because we'll, we'll kind of addle or injure their corpus luteum function uh, with our medications. So in artificial therapy, we use luteal support quite a bit. Um, I use it very often in people who've suffered um, one to two miscarriages. And I lovingly refer to it as witchcraft because it's really hard to prove that it works or it doesn't. But it's so innocuous that I use it fairly often. Um, and then, you know, previously the diagnosis of a luteal phase defect was, was done by a fairly invasive endometrial biopsy. These days we just tend to put people on supplemental progesterone because it's less invasive for the patient. There are a few other indications, but it's, it's generally for any time that you think that the secretion of progesterone in the luteal phase is insufficient, you can supplement it. Got it. Got it. We have a question here, and it's about low sperm count. If my husband has a low sperm count, would you still recommend regular sex right after my period? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, you know, the guys who have a, a lower sperm count or oligospermia often feel that if they store their sperm up that they'll do better. And of course, you know, there is a huge amount of biologic variability, but one ejaculation tends to prime more sperm production and release. So frequency of intercourse tends to be a good recipe for just about anybody. If the sperm count is very, very low, you may need some form of assistance. That can come in the form of some of the vitamins that we use for low count and motility. We have insemination techniques that can concentrate the sperm. And, you know, in, in really severe cases, we need to go to forms of IVF in order to help people. But trying to hold off on intercourse and to build up sperm in terms of concentration tends to be a flawed move. A lot of people do it, and it's, it's probably counterproductive. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay, that's all the questions that we have. And that was my segue into sperm. Look Perfect. at that. Wow. Great. You're really good at this. I try. So this is something I think a lot of people are going to connect with. Um, the further you get into your journey, eventually you understand that what used to be your love life is suddenly all about baby making. Um, sex with your partner becomes very mechanical, it's forced, often it's, um, it's on demand at, at what is a very inconvenient or inappropriate time of the day. And it's, it's because we're obsessed with timing, right? We become obsessed with timing because there are so many things that tell us how to make a baby. Um, you can log into a website, you can have something on your phone, um, there are commercial products available and you know both men and women don't excel at having intercourse on demand, right? We, we actually have physiologic mechanisms in which we warm up to intercourse and they're not instant. Um, females in particular take a lot longer to become sexually aroused than males. And so the concept of, of intercourse on demand in order to make a baby um, not only is very stressful for people, but in my opinion is counterproductive. And it, like everyone gets into this cycle, it's really hard to um, avoid it. But the sooner you can start talking about it with your partner, remembering the things that, that brought you together in the first place, um, really trying to preserve intimacy, I always say intimacy and spontaneity. Um, you know, just just coming up and cuddling, holding hands, you know, intimate touch, things that that just sort of start things working, rather than saying, "Okay, let's go. It's time to make a baby." And then, of course, people want to know, "Okay, well, when should I I have sex? Tell me exactly when you want me to have intercourse." how often, what time of day. Um, some patients even ask me what positions they should be using. And realistically, that is putting way too much stress on the situation. If, if there is an answer, um, it's that more is better. So 
daily intercourse is associated with the highest pregnancy rates, but it is only like a slight 2% advantage over every other day intercourse. So I say to patients very often, daily intercourse I think is something that teenagers are capable of, but most busy adults, that, that's a very lofty goal to achieve. And then the other thing that I mention is once a week is not often enough. So, you know, if your frequency of intercourse is once a week, right there, that's something that you need to address. Just trying to get one or two more acts of intercourse in, in a week just to increase the chance that sperm and egg will meet. In terms of the sperm, there are a lot of natural things that you can do to increase sperm quality. We already talked about the concept of more frequent ejaculation. Um, you know, a lot of the, the things that we're mentioning in tonight's webinar have gone been gone into in more depth in previous webinars. So we have an entire um, video available on male fertility and that's where we describe sort of the assembly line that is the production of a mature sperm cell. And I invite you to go back and have a look at that if you want to learn a more in-depth approach to sperm quality. But typically, the, the more sperm that you are ejaculating, the more you're priming your body for production. Healthy lifestyle we'll get into a little bit, um, but it, you know some of the, the factors there are quite obvious. We're going to talk a little bit about sperm-friendly lubricants, which I think are are a huge um, resource for people that not enough people tap into. And then some of the vitamins and antioxidants that we use in men. So sperm are not meant to be stored. That's kind of what I will leave it at. They, the longer that you leave them in the reproductive tract, they will break down. Their motility will be impaired. So really, you want to get the stored ones out of the way and make room for fresher, more mature, more motile sperm. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, if my partner is not in a fertile window, then I'm just going to leave myself alone, leave them alone, so that I, I store up my sperm for when the time is right. And that actually ends up being counterproductive. So we, we have, for guys, what we call the five-day rule. And that's no more than five days should go by without intercourse or ejaculation, regardless of what part of the fertility cycle you're in. Lifestyle for men is, is very, very important. And um, I put my number one contributor on top. We obviously, you know, cigarette smoke, marijuana use, um, binge drinking of alcohol, these have a known uh, negative effect on sperm quality. But obesity is one that really deserves more attention than it gets. Um, if, you know, men who reach a certain body weight can actually drive down sperm production at a, at a, at a um, you know, at, at a gonadotropic level, like right at the level of the hormone itself. So losing weight is a great first step, not only for better health, likely a better sex life, but better sperm production as well. And a lot of guys, um, you know, can be very hard on their partner in terms of their body weight and their lifestyle, but will seldom make the changes that they need to do because they think that the, the act of conception is all about uh, women and the female. But of course, men bring half of the genetic material, so it behooves everybody to to try to be their healthiest when being the creators of a healthy pregnancy. So if you're half of the contributor, you know, you need to work just as hard as your partner in terms of a healthy lifestyle and being your best. The stimulants that I'm talking about tend to be your mega doses of caffeine, um, you know, energy drinks, things that um, if taken in high enough doses would be a vasoconstrictor or a substance that would impair blood flow. Um, sperm production, particularly in the testicle, is really all about blood flow. 
So if you're drinking mega doses of caffeine or some of those rocket powered energy drinks, you might want to trade them in in favor of something that's a little bit less stimulatory. And then finally, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about sperm friendly lubricants. Um, a lot of patients, for the reasons that we talked about when talking about intimate relationships, will use a lubricant in order to um, make sex more comfortable and um, to you know, help to offset some of the lack of spontaneity that occurs with structured intercourse. Um, the problem with that is that a lot of over-the-counter store-bought lubricants are, are actually toxic to sperm. And, you know, so people would either avoid the use of a lubricant or use a lubricant that will, will actually um, decrease sperm motility. So what we advise people to do is, is to find a, a good product. And um, there's one available in Canada called um, uh, uh, Zestica um, Fertile uh, Lubricant. And this has actually been shown to statistically increase the amount of moving sperm isolated in ejaculate. So not only is it not um, toxic to sperm, it actually improves their ability to, to um, swim. And you know, a lot of couples have had success adding Zestico to their natural fertility therapy. Not only is intercourse more comfortable, but you know, the sperm is, is now able to swim better. We've had many couples who Zestica was the last piece of the puzzle that allowed them to achieve a healthy pregnancy. Um, that we will be carrying this through our clinic soon, but it is widely available. It's really not that hard to find. An absolutely fantastic product. Any questions about um, about intercourse and sperm? Um, we actually have four situational questions. Did you want to hold those off till the end, John? How situational are they? Um, they're all pretty situational. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you're being very cryptic. Um, well, you know, no. Well, why don't we? Why don't we tackle some of your questions? Just because last time, you know, I think you were a bit overwhelmed with the, all the leftover questions. So let's do a few. Good, good idea. Good idea. I'm sure we will get more as well, which is not a problem. All right. So this question is from Angela, and she says that she's had six IUIs to date. Two have ended in chemical pregnancies. She's also dealing with decreased ovarian reserve. Her husband's her husband's sperm count is normal. Should she continue with IUI? IUI with a normal sperm count? Um, I don't know. That's really debatable. Um, you know, my personal philosophy is that if, if I have a good semen analysis that shows me that there is a, um, a certain threshold amount of sperm, I'll offer people the um, the option of, of just pursuing intercourse if they're still comfortable with it. Um, you know, I won't get into the numbers that I use in terms of the threshold, but there is a certain amount of sperm that, that does not require insemination or gets no benefit from insemination. The only instances where we would use insemination services in those patients is if, you know, kind of the 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 stress of intercourse at home has become so much for them that they want to make sure that they get it one, at least one quality sample close to the egg. So for people who, you know, intercourse has actually become stressful for them, we'll do the insemination just to try to alleviate that. But from a medical standpoint, once you get above a certain threshold amount of sperm, IUI doesn't offer a, a tremendous amount of medical benefit. Got it. But we have a question here from Erin, and she says, my doctor won't send me for any test until I've had three miscarriages. She's had two, or sorry, she's currently had two, one was at five weeks, and one blighted ovum at 10 weeks. Is progesterone available without prescription? Uh, no, it's not. And, um, well, actually, at, at least not any of the pharmacologic stuff. Um, 
you know, realistically, um, it may not be a, a luteal defect alone that, that is causing the issue. There are some really simple tests that can be done in the office that can determine um, potential contributors to miscarriage. Your doctor is correct that the diagno you know, diagnosis of what's called recurrent pregnancy loss is based on three consecutive losses, but most of my patients don't want to suffer that third loss in order to, to qualify for the diagnosis. So we have some easy tests that we can do um, that are office-based that can help us to figure out what potential contributors might be. Um, I would get yourself referred to somebody in your area. If, uh, you know, if you're within my catchment area, which is, is fairly broad, um, we have a self-referral process through our website where you don't need your family doctor to, to refer you. And we can generally see people in pretty short course. Perfect. All right. Thanks, John. We have another question here from Sarah. And she says that she has a low ovarian reserve. To be specific, her level is 3.5 PMOL. She's heard people with low reserve sometimes don't produce many follicles, if any at all. She's been developing seven on her right and nine on her left with two being 1.9 centimeters and the other being 1.8 centimeters. Is this good growth and is this normal for my AMH level? Also, what supplements should, be, should I be on to help with my low AMH? One more. Also, is IVF an option for people with low ovarian reserve due to the lower number of eggs? Okay. So that one I'm going to save until later. That's an, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I got a little case study at the end of our presentation specifically talking about decreased ovarian reserve. And I'd happy, be happy to loop back and answer um, that case scenario at that time. So just remind me about that one. I will. Um, I think I got it all in my head. So <laughs> yeah, um, that's very interesting. And it, you know, it, it's it's kind of typical of the you know complexity and variability of, of individual cases. There, there's no one number that encapsul encapsulates everything. And as much as we're all trying to support one another through this process, everyone's case is unique. And you know. You can't sort of say that what worked for your neighbor is necessarily going to work for you. Um, part of the challenge of fertility therapy is is finding an individual solution, and that that can be, um, you know, that can be a long process at times. Mm -hmm. We have a question that I've heard before. What is your thoughts about hot tubs and sperm production, um, and for women's fertility? Um, you know, you notice it didn't make my list of lifestyle issues. Mm -hmm. So I, I would much rather people eat good food, not smoke cigarettes, not do drugs, you know, than, than worry about occasional hot tub use. Um, the female reproductive organs are, are internal, so they're a lot more um, resistant to changes in temperature than the male. Um, male reproductive organs don't like heat as a rule and um, and so you know excessive hot tubbing is um, discouraged in men but you know it's it, it's not a it's not a complete um, injury right so you you know you're not going to cause permanent damage to the testicles through hot tubbing you might just denature some of the the sperm that are, are in the tract at that time so it's not a killer. Um, people ask about it all the time, and it, it just doesn't rank that high in terms of potential contributors. Hmm. Interesting. Um, this question is from Samantha. Are there any better positions than others for sperm mobility? No. Um, so one of the things that people need to remember about sperm is that you have never seen sperm, right? Semen is the carrier for sperm and during intercourse it's deposited in the vagina and the sperm are released from the semen almost instantaneously. So oftentimes you know you'll see things that 
that you know come back, drip out, um, run out, and, and you think that a particular position, being tucked up, being upside down, is better for you because you think if you can keep the semen in a particular position, then it's more likely to go where it needs to go. In reality, the sperm has already been flung along its path. If the semen runs back out, it's not a big deal. Hmm. You got it. Um, I've got another question here. Um, have you ever heard of using soft cup that is typically used for menstrual cycle to assist in keeping sperm in place after intercourse to increase pregnancy? And I think that kind of, you know, ties yeah. to your question. Yeah. I've, I've heard of it. Um, theoretically, I, I just, I, I don't agree with it. Um, just because what I know about the mechanics of sperm suggests that it doesn't need to be hold, held in place. You know, it, um, they, they really are often running from, from the minute that they're deposited in the, in the vagina. And, um, you know, if you look at sperm under a microscope for a long time, you, you're amazed at their ability to swim. Um, you know, we've, we were doing some research last year, and we had sperm that was in a, um, a vaginal incubator for three days. And when we put the material under the microscope, um, the stuff was still just, you know, swimming as fast as it was from, from the first moment. So they're, they're you know... They're a lot more um, vigorous than we give them credit for. They, they typically don't need help from gravity and such. Okay, awesome. Um, so this is a question from Amanda. How can you test your cervix opening um, if you don't know what to feel? You're talking about the cervical mucus or... so. That's a good if you question. menstruate, your cervix is open. Um, you know, there, there's there's very few cases of of complete cervical stenosis. So if menstrual blood can get through there, sperm can get through there. Um, some people do have cervical scarring, um, and that's something that really a, like a doctor needs to look at in order to diagnose. But if you're talking about cervical mucus. Um, it will usually pool in the bottom of the vagina, and then you need to be able to um, qualitatively um, determine when it's it's the right texture. And what we often describe it as is, is tacky, meaning that if you spread it between your your thumb and your index finger, it will sort of have like a cobweb-like feel to it, and that's when you know that it's um, fertile cervical mucus. It sounds gross, but it's extraordinarily accurate. <laughs> Got it. Um, and one more question here, and, and I have not forgotten about the other question, so I still have it here for later on as well. All right. Um, this question is from Sophia. She is seeing a fertility spe specialist after having three conse consecutive miscarriages, and she did the RPL test, and they all came back normal. Um, her doctor recommended co CoQ10 for egg health as she's over 35. Is there any other suggestion you would give? Oh, uh, well, the, um, can't, I can't sort of give specific suggestions. Um, well, I didn't do my little disclaimer at the front of the webinar. Um, without meeting people and, and taking a history and examining them, I can't give them, um, specific suggestions. Um, I'm very big on CoQ10 as a um, potential helper. Um, in people who have decreased ovarian reserve, the other supplement that I often use is DHEA. We're going to be getting into that at, at, at the end of this talk once I get through the more um, typical vitamins that I use. But if there's, if there's kind of an X factor for me, it's DHEA. And in someone who's had repetitive miscarriages, um, you know, unless there's an element of insulin resistance there, um, which we'll see in, in patients who are overweight or have a family history of type 2 diabetes, the issue, if, if all of the immunologic stuff has been done and is negative, the issue is, is either insulin resistance or decreased ovarian reserve, and you need to know which one of those it is 
in order to craft a proper treatment protocol. Okay. All right. Um, that's Maybe we'll all. get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> we have only one more question, but I'm thinking what we'll do, actually we have two questions. I'm thinking we can go through this particular section and then answer those near the end. Yeah. Okay. Well, like I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about um, vitamins and antioxidants, but of course, if you really want to get um, in depth on this, I hate to keep hawking the previous webinars, but we did um, an hour on this way back when called Natural Fertility Supplements That Really Work, um, where we, we break down the individual components of the multivitamin supplements that we use. Um, I My preference for everybody would be that they get the elements that they need through diet. Um, you know, I suppose it would be my preference for myself as well, but I know that I, I make mistakes in terms of my eating habits, and I don't always um, either get as many meals or as good quality meals as I should in a day. And so supplements are important in terms of trying to get those extra elements into your body. When you're trying to become pregnant, I think a, you know, a, an over-the-counter multivitamin is not enough because I don't think it's specific, specific enough to the, the problem at hand. So we tend to recommend comprehensive vitamin supplements that are actually engineered for both male and female fertility. Um, we use Canadian products and we have two options that we use for men. Um, the Fertile Pro MTL has a little bit of coenzyme Q10 in it and if there was a sort of a, a general approach for we know that all men who take antioxidants have an increased chance of getting their partners pregnant. Um, Fertile Pro MTL is, is a very good basic one. However, if you know that there's an issue particularly with sperm motility, Fertile Pro with L-carnitine would be my choice for that particular individual. Um, L-carnitine um, has been studied for years in terms of its ability to boost sperm function. Um, it's a very powerful amino acid, has very few side effects at all. If, if you're really serious about pursuing natural fertility therapy, you know, I would look at getting the male partner on one of these two because they, um, they have no side effects, lots of extra health benefits as well, and they do improve sperm quality. For women, um, the, you know, there needs to be a basic vitamin and often something that assesses ovarian or addresses the issue of ovarian reserve. So Fertile Pro Women is, is a very basic, um, you know, the essential building blocks and elements that you need for healthy pregnancy, in particular the proper amount of folic acid. Whereas Fertile Pro LQ contains a little bit more coenzyme Q10 and, and as well um, an amino acid called L-arginine which tends to um, help with blood flow. So the basic one which I would recommend for anybody trying to conceive would be Fertile Pro for women. But if you're, if you're older or you have decreased ovarian reserve, your base supplement should probably be Fertile Pro LQ. Now, the supplements, the base supplements, are, are really just things that um, are the foundation of uh, vitamin-based therapy. The two others that we use are coenzyme Q10 and DHEA. I would really invite you to go back and look at the webinar, Natural Health Supplements That Really Work, because in that one I break down the concept of oxidative stress quite a bit more. We know that as our cells age, their ability to repair themselves or their ability to sustain the damage caused by oxidative stress is less. And that's why so many people are talking about natural forms of antioxidants available in diet these days. Uh, we all want to look and feel younger. And when it comes to having babies, some of us are trying to create families at older ages both men and women benefit from antioxidant use and it's been shown that men who use antioxidants 
have a significantly increased chance of achieving pregnancy with their partner. In women, there has been some fascinating um, research on coenzyme Q10 in animal embryos, and you know, CoQ10 is is a very um, powerful antioxidant. It has a lot of health benefits outside of uh, fertility, and its potential to improve egg quality, although not proven, holds um, massive potential benefit for people. You know, the, the, you know, we don't have the evidence in humans yet, but it's certainly there's no downside at all to taking CoQ10, and for a lot of our patients, it's made a tremendous difference. Um, we currently prescribe it as either 300 milligrams twice a day, um, which is a you know that's a lot of pills. So a lot of our patients will prefer to take the concentrated form, which is ubiquinol, and take 100 milligrams twice a day. Ubiquinol is the more active form of coenzyme Q10, so you can take a couple of the much smaller tablets and actually get more antioxidant effect than if you're taking the 600 milligrams a day of coenzyme Q10. It all depends on, on price and availability, um, but both of them work very well as an antioxidant. The vitamins often generate questions. Are there any questions about um, the over-the-counter vitamins? We actually do. Um, and I just wanted to let everybody know that I have pasted in a link to the webinar section on the Fertility Ontario website because um, as Dr. John McNutt said, we have some amazing webinars on there that talk more in depth about a lot of these topics. We actually just redesigned that particular area of the website so it's a lot easier to use. So um, please feel free to visit the link in the chat box and you'll be able to see some more of this information. Um, and I think we even have a webinar that really talked about coenzyme Q10 quite in depthly as well. So, oh yeah, we yeah we really went into it. Like, there's um, male fertility is on there, nutrition and metabolism is on there, um, natural health supplements. Um, yeah, there there are a number of, number of things that tie into our natural fertility program. So if, you know if you're interested in learning more, definitely hit up that webinar section. Absolutely. Okay. We have a question here about coenzyme Q10. How much Q10 should the woman man take? Are there any brand, is there any brand names that are accept, that are acceptable? Well, it, 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 it kind of gets down to um, what's easiest for the patient. So we'll go back to that last slide. Um, if you're taking coenzyme Q10, um, which is the, um, less bioavailable form than ubiquinol, what you want is 300 milligrams twice a day. Um, and that comes from a colleague of mine who has done most of the research on coenzyme Q10. Um, if you're using the, the reduced form, which is ubiquinol, that's more biologically available and more potent. And so you can get away with 100 milligrams twice a day and the, the capsules tend to be smaller. So um, if it's available to you, I recommend ubiquinol, but if you're in an area where you can't purchase ubiquinol, then you can go and get, you know, store-bought coenzyme Q10. You just need to take 300 milligrams twice a day. Ends up being a lot of pills, so we, you know, we, we recommend you trying to get the concentrated form if you can. Got it. It's a really good question, actually. Um, so somebody's asking, does 400 mg's of Q10 two times a day if so, if you're taking over the amount that you just noted, is that harmful? I don't think so. You, you know, your body is probably just peeing up the rest. You can only, the, the things with vitamins and supplements, which we all know, is that our body has a limited ability to extract the nutrients from them, right? Mm -hmm. um, our body much prefers to, you know, see things in a more natural form, like through fruits, vegetables, and nuts. Um, that's how we're designed to extract nutrients from food. So when you're taking over-the-counter supplements, you, you know, you can only get so much out of them, and then the rest will just be filtered through your system. Got it. 
Got it. We have a question here from Lori. What's the typical amount of DHEA per day that somebody should be taking? Um, so we'll, we'll get into this, but it, with everybody, I do 25 milligrams three times a day. Perfect. I think it's, it's going to be more about who should be taking DHEA and, um, you know, kind of select, you know, I, I don't give it to everybody. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get you into my sort of thinking around that. Some of my colleagues do give it to everybody. Um, it's, it is a prescription substance, so I try to, to sort of pick my battles in terms of who gets DHEA. But um, the case study that we're, we're about to look at will get into it a little bit. Okay. I have another um, Q10 question. Can coenzyme Q10 be found naturally in fresh, in fresh foods? I'm worried yeah. taking pills and I'm worried taking pills and I usually um, use a juicer and juice vegetables or fruit concentrate for supplements. Absolutely. Um, Grapeseed extract is the one that comes to mind, um, but I know that it, it is available in other forms as well. Um, I got into that a little bit in our natural health fertility supplements, but um, you know we used to use a product that had more vegetable components to it, and their main source of CoQ10 was grapeseed extract. Um, juicing is phenomenal, by the way. So you know you're you're really on the right path with. Um, with using a good juicer. Your body loves getting nutrients that way. Okay, great. This is a question from Samantha. When it comes to prenatals, her body just reacts negatively to niacin and biotin. How important are these to the body? Um, important, but not vital. Like those are things that can generally be found in decent food sources. Um, I think when you're supplementing, you, you want to focus on things that, that aren't commonly found in diet. So if you eat a balanced diet, you should be getting adequate sources of that. So, you know, if, but from a prenatal standpoint, the one thing that you can't miss out on is folic acid. So, you know, anyone who is planning on becoming pregnant um, really needs to be getting some form of folate into their system. If you don't like the, um, the typical prenatal vitamin, um, you can try some of the formulations that we use. We've had a lot of people who, who really dislike um, what was commercially available, and they find the Canadian products that we use very palatable. So, you know, don't give up on it. it um, sometimes it's just a matter of, of trying something that suits you, but definitely at the top of the list has got to be that folic acid. Got it. And this is actually related to folic acid. This question is from Sylvia. What dose of folic acid is best for women in their late 30s? Oh, that's kind of a hotly debated issue right now. <laughs> I don't know if it's hotly debated, but um, I recommend a milligram um, for all patients. You know, we used to recommend 0 0.4 milligrams and then sort of stratify based on, on who we thought needed more. Um, but a milligram is a very good dose for a high proportion of patients. And then, you know, patients who are at significant risk for developing neural tube defects or on medications that would put them at risk for that, you, you really need to be talking to your family doctor or your obstetrician about what dose that you're on because in, the, in cases like that, oftentimes one milligram won't be enough. Um, but for most people in their mid-30s, a milligram of folate is just fine. Great. Um, so this is on the previous topic. This is from Erin. Any thoughts on raspberry extract or rosemary extract for fertility and uterine health? Sort of as a, as a uterine tonic? Um, kind of. I, like, I use magnesium with a, for a much similar indication, so... I believe they work in, in kind of the same way. Um, uterine contractions, we didn't really get into in terms of the natural fertility method, but I like a vitamin that has a little bit of magnesium in it just because magnesium is, is a muscle calmer. Um, 
you know, there's some uterine contractions are necessary to, you know, to move the sperm forward and to, you know, to nestle the, the egg into the, into the lining, but other uterine contractions are, are pathologic. So, I don't know, I, my preference is to have a little bit of a muscle calmer in the system. Um, if raspberry, um, raspberry tea or, or extract you're using for that purpose, I think it's probably beneficial. Awesome. This question is from Stacy. Um, do you know if testing one's thyroid is a standard test for fertility? Um, it is amongst REIs, but I don't know if it's a, a standard test by your family doctor. Um, and in sort of our, our brand of fertility me medicine, um, we tend to be somewhat aggressive in um, treating what we call subclinical hypothyroidism. Um, so even in the, in the patient who doesn't have signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, we'll often, you know, treat the number and different clinics will have more aggressive ceilings for, for what they consider necessary to treat. Um, as in many cases, it's probably over treatment in a lot of cases, but a thyroid replacement is generally not harmful to people. Um, and it, you know, there is benefit in terms of reproductive outcomes if you're truly hypothyroid. But it's, uh, it's, it's one of those areas that you can test on the machine one day and, and your TSH will be high. You retest the next day and it's totally normal. So it's, it's difficult because you're, you're really just treating a number. Got it. Got it. Um, so this is another question about supplements. Talking about the uterus, any supplement, are there any supplements that are beneficial for women that have or have that had abdominal myectomy? I don't even know if I'm saying that correctly. <laughs> Myo, myomectomy. Yeah, abdominal myomectomy. Yeah, myomectomy. so that's somebody who's, who's had a fibroid removed through major surgery. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, again, you know, I... I like uh, I like magnesium as sort of a a calmer of the smooth muscle that's in the uterus. But uh, how did like are you, if you're talking about healing from the myomectomy or preventing the regrowth of, of fibroids that are left behind, I really don't know the answer to that question. Okay. All right, and this question is from Sarah. She says she's not taking Q10 or DHEA, but she is taking royal jelly. Estro Smart, which helps balance hormones, red raspberry capsules, along with the regular omega-3 fish oils and B100 complex and folic acid, and her prenatal. Is this enough, or should she be canceling these and taking Q10 and DHEA? Can't answer that question. All I said at the start is this, this is my particular brand of natural fertility therapy. I, I can't really tell you whether it works better than somebody else's. Um, you know, I, I like I like my approach because it is is relatively simple. Um, you know, it 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 it, it has a you know um, more publications surrounding it. Um, I understand it better when I'm confident in something. My patients are confident in it. But that isn't to say that the use of maca or royal jelly, um, you know, raspberry leaf extract is, is, is inferior to what I do. It just, for me, I can't, I don't want to have too many variables in the mix. So I've streamlined my approach down to, to this. But it doesn't mean that, it, that one approach is better than another. Good, good answer. Um... We have a question about soy pro products. Is soy products, are soy products bad for fertility? Um, so Miriam read that soy, soy produces estrogen in the body and that's not good for fertility. Well, you know, soy is a phyto, or it's like a weak phytoestrogen. Um, if you give estrogen in very large amounts, you can inhibit the development of follicles because you are sending a feedback loop to the brain that says that you don't require the production of estrogen. 
However, you know, how much soy would you have to ingest in order to actually inhibit your, your feedback loop? I would think a tremendous amount. Um, so, you know, really everything in moderation, um, you know, particularly for people who are, are vegetarian or vegan, like, um, you know, soy is, is an important component of their diet. So um, it's, it, it's not going to make you infertile or it's not going to augment infertility. Um, it, but if, you know, if you're not ovulating, you need to address that, right? So if your brain is not sending out the signal that causes you to ovulate, then you have to figure out what is causing that. It's probably not soy, I can tell you that, but you need to get to the root of the problem because if you don't ovulate, you're not going to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm thinking we have, I think we're down to about two questions here, so I'll, I'll do one more and then we'll pop over to, is this the last part of your presentation, John? Yeah, yeah, we're just going to, you know, we're going to kind of talk about an extreme example um, and, and talk about why I use natural fertility with decreased ovarian reserve. Um, but let, let's do a few more questions and I'll, then I'll kind of lead into that a bit. Okay, perfect. Should DHEA be taken by someone with PCOS? <sighs> Jeez, these are tough questions today. Yeah, they are. <laughs> um, so I, you know, people with PCOS kind of by definition have high ovarian reserve. I only give DHEA to people who have decreased ovarian reserve. Um, you know, I also don't measure DHEA sulfate in the bloodstream. And I know other people do that. Um, for, for my purposes, I don't give my PCO patients DHEA. If, if someone else has a, a sound clinical rationale as to why they do, then, you know, by all means, but, um, you know, it, with respect to my personal practices, no, I don't do that. I have an easy question here for you. Um, oh, good. Yes. Do you specialize in fertility issues in men or do you refer male and infer male infertility to a urologist? Um, I specialize in the evaluation of sperm and sperm parameters and, you know, testing of, um, of uh, male fertility in a laboratory setting. Um, what I don't do is examine men because I don't really know what I'm looking at. So if I suspect that there's a physical contributor to male infertility, then I'll enlist the role of a urologist. Or if I need a, a surgical biopsy for, for fertility purposes, um, then, you know, I, like we'll get a urologist on board. Um, I see men quite a bit. I just don't actively surgically treat male patients because I'm a gynecologist. Okay. For endometriosis related complications, are there particular supplements or methods to improve fertilization and implantation? <sighs> um, endometriosis tends to have a global effect on um, fertility. And so I think a lot of the, the holistic components of natural fertility therapy work well. However, they, they do need to be done in, in concert with some of the better um, therapies of endometriosis, which tend to be medical. Um, that person mentioned complications from endometriosis therapy. Oftentimes, in, you know, in the surgical treatment of endo, you can damage healthy tissue and that can lead to a drop in ovarian function. Um, you know, you can look at some of the adjuncts like DHEA and coenzyme Q10 in that setting, but once the damage is done, it's very difficult to actually repair it. Okay, great. And I'm hoping this is an easy question. Do you use aspirin as part of natural therapy? No. No, I, I, I use baby aspirin as part of my witchcraft for recurrent pregnancy loss, but I don't routinely prescribe it as natural fertility therapy. Um, you know, it's just, uh, again, I, I don't like to have too many variables on board. 
but I do know some people who use baby aspirin quite a bit. I use it in the setting of, of people who suffered losses um, and really you know you could challenge me on the scientific basis that I use for that. Um, fertility therapy has, has sort of become that just um, it's it's more a matter of um, you know experience and results than than clinical evidence because nobody wants to be the guinea pig in, in a trial these days so over time and with experience you learn what works and you know one person has their method another has another um, none of none of what any of you are suggesting is right or wrong you know so if you take baby aspirin you know that's that's a no harm right you're not gonna hurt yourself by taking baby aspirin so if your provider has thrown that in the mix yeah by all means Okay, great. We have a question about IVF. Um, so we have somebody here considering IVF since she was diagnosed with endometriosis and she believes that she's issues with her tube that would need to go, need to go through, so that she would need to go through other less intrusive fertility treatment. Oh, would she need to go through other less intrusive fertility treatment first or can she go straight to IVF? Can she go straight to IVF? Mm -hmm. Sure, I think I did a poor job reading this. She's considering IVS, IVF since she was diagnosed with endometriosis, and she believes yeah. she has issues with her tubes or with a tube. Well, you, I mean, you can always go straight to IVF, right? Like, there's, there's if someone wants to pursue that therapy, there's, there's very seldom anyone standing in their way. Um, it's just a question of sort of what the best option is. Um, with endometriosis, we tend to treat it medically first, and we'll often spend several months treating it medically before going to IVF. Um, I have a lot of patients who, you know, will go through medical therapy for endometriosis and choose to go through natural fertility, fertility therapy for three to six months before proceeding to IVF. And I don't have any information that says that, you know, that their fertility is not going to be improved after having their endo treated medically. Um, as long as you don't do something that physiologically increases their estrogen, which might worsen their endometriosis, I think, you know, making attempts at natural fertility is, is a fine option. Um, ultimately, if the patient has very severe endometriosis, there should be some um, consideration of going to IVF, though. Got it. Um, do you give DHEA to your patients during IVF? And can DHEA interfere with monitoring hormone levels during the IVF cycle? Uh, I give it to people who have decreased ovarian reserve during IVF cycles. And if anything, it seems to help. So it doesn't muck around with things at all. Cool. Um, what exactly does the DHEA do, and how long does one need to take it until it has an effect on ovarian reserve? Okay, I'm going to get into our case study, and we'll talk a little bit more about DHEA. I, I, I did think it would be the thing that everyone wanted to talk about. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I, I will answer that question as we go along. Um, so I'm going to move on to the concept of, of decreased ovarian reserve. And... Um, you know, when I say that I'm an expert in natural fertility therapy, this this is how I became one. Um, because I, you know, I typically would look at people with a low egg count in the past and say, oh my goodness, you know, time is running out. We need to pull out the heavy artillery. Um, how soon can we get you into an IVF cycle? And I would find that the results in IVF were really underwhelming, um, downright poor sometimes. And as the information on vitamin therapy and coenzyme Q10 and eventually DHEA came out, I would put my patients on those supplements before they went to a second round of IVF. And lo and behold, a lot of my patients would get pregnant spontaneously. And it made me rethink 
the entire concept around the patient with decreased ovarian reserve. Um, I'll tell you who we think those people are. Um, and this, again, I hate to keep plugging the webinars, but age and fertility. <laughs> that was one of our first webinars, and we went into this concept quite a bit. Yeah. Um, you only get so many eggs, and they cannot be replaced. They are used at a constant rate, and quite simply, some women have a larger supply of eggs than others. So, you know, if you get to a certain maternal age, it is almost a certainty that quality and quantity will go down. If your, your basal levels of follicle-stimulating hormone are quite high, that tells us that you have a very serious problem because that's one of the last things to, to go in terms of um, sensitive markers of ovarian reserve. You'll get a more um, early warning from AMH levels, which will often deteriorate years in advance of FSH levels. And we measure our values out of a lab in Toronto using the units picomoles per liter. And um, there are other laboratories available that use a different set of units. I, I've arbitrarily kind of said that an AMH of greater than 15 picomoles per liter is reassuring and typically if you have a value of 11 or less I will treat you as, as having decreased ovarian reserve. The cases that are, are really challenging are the people who get down below 5 picomoles per liter which why is why I'm very interested about the lady who we're going to talk about later who has the AMH of 3.5 picomoles per liter because what she, by what she tells us she sure doesn't behave that way. And then, of course, the, the ultrasound um, correlate of the AMH level is the antrophollicle count. And, um, you know, typically, it, you know, if, if we see less than six total antrophollicles, that's pretty, um, pretty marked a decrease in ovarian reserve. So I'm going to tell you about my patient, Christina and whether or not she might benefit from natural fertility therapy. So Christina's 36, which in our business is pretty young. She's never been pregnant. She came to my clinic. She has normal fallopian tubes. Her husband has had a normal semen analysis. But her basal FSH level is 11, which is not a good sign. She has an antrophollicle count of 2. And her AMH, which we measured several times, was 0.0, .0 picomoles per liter. So this is a you know fairly significant case of somebody with decreased ovarian reserve. And the question always comes up, should I do IVF? And I told you what a few years ago my answer would have been to that question. It would have been, sure, let's get you into IVF as fast as possible. But over time, I found that patients with low AMH levels did very poorly in IVF. And I think the reason for that is that the AMH is a very good predictor of how many eggs we're going to get from the patient. So, you know, Christina probably has good quality eggs at the age of 36. But when we put her through an IVF process, her AMH tells us that we're not really going to retrieve that many. The human body is actually the best incubator for an egg. And when we take the egg outside of the human body, it's a tremendous stress to that egg. And the only way that you're going to get around that is, number one, having an exceptional IVF laboratory, and number two, having a lot of eggs. So if you don't have a lot of eggs to start with, the chance of them not making it through this very stressful process is relatively small. And in that circumstance, and it's actually my standard answer now, I advise patients with otherwise normal parameters to go through natural fertility therapy. And here's what I did for Christina. So I put both her and her partner on comprehensive vitamin supplements, the stuff that we use. 
And there was nothing wrong with her partner's sperm from a laboratory standpoint. But we know that guys who take antioxidant treatment are more likely to get their wives pregnant. I put this lady on um, coenzyme Q10 as ubiquinol, 100 milligrams, twice a day. And then I put her on DHEA, 25 milligrams, three times a day. And so that was her supplement-based therapy. The final thing that I do, which is a prescription medication, is Femera or Letrozole. Two and a half milligrams taken for five days. And that just naturally increases the body's own follicle-stimulating hormone production so that you get the production of a more mature follicle. After we had concocted all of the vitamin and prescription um, treatment plan. Of course, we had to counsel the patient about the, you know, you know, the onset and frequency of intercourse. And again, we didn't use IUI in this circumstance. We really just focused on, you know, the the intimate relationship between this couple, and you know, trying to empower them to take back their own opportunity at creating a family. And of course, the result is that this lady with the AMH of 0.0, .0 has not only been pregnant once through this regimen, she actually came back this year and got pregnant again and has delivered two very healthy babies and her anti-malarian hormone level has never budged from 0.0, .0 picomoles per liter. So she's had an absolutely astonishing um, response to natural fertility therapy. And of course, I'm using it as an extreme example, but this is commonly what I recommend for people with low ovarian reserve. And of course, the you know I think the biggest X factor would be the use of DHEA. Um, DHEA is an androgen. And it's only available by prescription in Canada. In the states, it is um, available over the counter. Uh, I can't tell you whether or not it's legal to go down to the States and buy it and bring it back. I, I really and truly don't know. Um, it, it probably does its work within the ovary itself, and not only the ovary, but the, the follicular fluid. That's the, the, that's the compartment that the egg itself is actually housed in. Um, there's many theories about how DHEA works, but it probably alters testosterone levels inside follicular fluid and allows the, the energy producing cells of the ovary or the mitochondria to function better. Um, again, no one knows precisely how it works, but I can tell you from experience that it, it you know, it's a, it's a palpable effect that you see in patients who take it. The qualitative aspects of their, of their ovulation and follicular quality are, are very noticeable. Now, I'm a fan of DHEA. Um, a couple years ago, I was not a fan of DHEA. I was I was in the no category. You know, I thought it was untested. I thought it was dangerous. Um, you know, I I remember saying at one point, I I I'm not using that stuff. But over time, you know, you 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 try it in extreme situations like Christina's and you realize that there is some benefit there. And then the more that you use DHEA, you realize that there really, really isn't that much harm because the side effect profile is, is not bothersome to patients. It tends to cause some oily skin and really other than that, like they don't grow a beard or a mustache or lose their hair or anything like that. So it's a very mild androgen. Um, in the States, people will go on to actually continue it into the first trimester because there are you know, certain experts who believe that it lowers the risk of miscarriage. For me, that's where I stop. I, I really, I'm not comfortable using a male hormone um, in the early pregnancy, so I don't use it throughout the first trimester, and I only use it in people who have decreased ovarian reserve. But in that setting, it works very, very well. Okay, so that's got to get us back to our question about the lady 
who has the AMH of 3.5. Mm -hmm. And she has follicles of 18 and 19 millimeters. Yep. How old is she? One second in my answered questions. I cannot see it, actually. Um, I'm, oh, she's 36. <laughs> oh. There we go. Yeah, like if, um, if her fallopian tubes are open and sperm parameters are good, um, and those are her numbers, I mean, personally, I would pursue natural fertility therapy just as I, I described it for three to six months. And if that doesn't achieve a pregnancy, at that point you could consider IVF. But I, I would definitely exhaust your opportunity with natural fertility therapy before proceeding to IVF. A lot of people think that if they do that, they're going to run out of time. But a 36-year-old doesn't diminish their ovarian reserve that rapidly. You know, you can afford yourself three or four months to optimize natural fertility therapy, and your chances in IVF three to six months later are going to be every bit as good. Got it. Okay. I have a few more questions here if you're ready for them. I bet. Okay. <laughs> How long does it take for coenzyme Q10 to be effective once starting, i.e. within the first cycle? Uh, no one knows the answer to that question. Um, I think it takes about six weeks. That's just a theory. Um, that's based on the, the concept. Remember, we, we kind of talked about how that, um, that cycle doesn't really have a start and a stop to it. Mm -hmm. The follicles are produced in a continuum. You're, you're not going to affect the, the follicles that are about to be ovulated, but you probably do have an effect on next month's um, crop of, of potential eggs. And so I would expect to see qualitative effects from coenzyme Q10 in, you know, six weeks or more. Most people say three cycles, but, you know, s six weeks makes sense if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Is there a benefit from using DHEA for someone with increased maternal age of 40, but with normal or good ovarian reserve? Probably. You know, um, because we know so little about it, um, you know, and because it, it acts at the level of, of the follicular fluid, like some of the theories about it say that it, it stabilizes the, the intracellular architecture of the egg. And we know that, that that is an issue in older women. We know that mitochondrial function is an issue in older women. So if you're beyond the age of 40 and you're attempting, I think, you know, the use of DHEA, even with normal parameters, would be, would be pretty reasonable. I, I, I certainly couldn't fault somebody for making that decision. Is the amount of folic acid in Pregvit too much? Can extra folic acid be harmful? Uh, like Pregvit folate 5? I, I don't know. I, I shouldn't. Um, yeah, you know what? In an online situation, I can't answer that question. Okay. I, I, can't, uh, I can't criticize a brand name product without um, doing some research on it. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Okay. I might have another question in that same boat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me. Is Femera better than Clomid? Well, I think so, but it's like I like you know that's just my preference. Um, I think clomiphene works better in people who have polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, but for people who have you know, idiopathic infertility or decreased ovarian reserve. I personally prefer Femera. Um, its side effect profile is, is usually a bit more favorable. Its twinning rate is less. Um, that's just where my, you know, most of my cases have been with Femera. I don't use a lot of clomiphene, but I know other people who use a lot of clomiphene. So it, um, 
you know, they should be looked at, I suppose, as, a, as equivalent. A lot of the things I do are, are just out of personal preference. Got it. Got it. Um, would you give Clomid or would Clomid be given to guys? And if yes, in what cases? Um, I personally don't believe in the use of clomiphene in males, um, but it has been it has been used. Um, there are people who prescribe it. I just I don't personally believe that it works. Okay. Okay, got it. All right, so now this is a situational question, um, and it might be too situational to answer, but this is um, Sarah, so she was the woman who, who we just talked about with her previous question. Um, she's going in tomorrow and Saturday for her next two UI days, and it's her second month of IUI. Should she stop other pills, go on your protocol, wait a few months, and then start again, and try IUI for three to six more months? Three to six more months, like you said. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty uh, situational. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't answer that question either because I don't know what the partner's sperm looks like. You know, it's, it's yeah, I shouldn't. I'm going to leave that one be. Okay. Because, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a little too specific. So that's that's kind of specific medical advice, and we we really can't give that out in this venue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, gotta leave that one alone. No problem. Um. All right. So this is okay. So this is a question about DH, DHEA in the U.S. When you buy DHEA in the U.S., you can buy DHEA by itself or with added herbal ingredients such as wild yam root. False unicorn root and chase tree berry concentrate. Is it best to take only the pure DHEA or is taking the added herbals beneficial? Do you say unicorn root? It, I did say unicorn root and I had a difficult time saying it without laughing. <laughs> well, I'm fundamentally opposed to the abuse of unicorns, so <laughs> I would probably just get the regular DHEA. <gasps> yep. Good question. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I've never heard of that before. <laughs> yeah, me neither. That's yep. that's my one thing for the day. Yep. Um, no, I think you know probably the the pure DHEA um, would be preferred. I I, I think the the less uh, variables you're juggling, the better. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I gotta tell you the the whole unicorn thing threw me for a loop there. So I, I I'm not sure how to answer that. <laughs> Um, I'm going to, I'm going to actually research that after this. Um, okay. Just, just because I like to know that type of stuff, but, um, alrighty. Um, let me see here. Do you recommend natural fertility therapy for couples with low motility? Uh, it depends on the situation. Um, you know, if you have, you know, normal sperm concentration, and motility is the only issue. I think exploring um, the use of, of antioxidants and vitamins is a very strong option. Um, you can couple that with, um, you know, the use of a sperm-friendly lubricant as well. And I think, you know, there's a lot of potential there. Some of our guys don't make a lot of sperm, and so you know, when the sperm are are concentrated in very small numbers. We don't have a lot of options, but if the sperm is there, there are supplements that can get them moving. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me see here. Um, I have two possibly situational questions. Um, okay, we'll do this one. If if I've had a now these words are killing me. His hysterosalpinogram. Yep. <laughs> and it was normal. Do you recommend having a, a sonohistogram performed for more accuracy? And sorry for I, I'm sure butchering those words. No, they're they're sort of um, 
they're for Tugel um, status, they they have an equivalent amount of accuracy. Um, the reason I do a sauna histogram in a lot of patients is it it gives a much better look at the inside of the uterus. So a um, hysterosalpingogram is an X-ray technique, and it just kind of gives you like a, a flat image of the pelvis. Mm. A, a sauna histogram is a fluid-filled ultrasound, and it's much better at assessing the interior portion of the uterus. So I will I I do a sauna on pretty much everybody, because that's the area where the embryo implants, and if you know if you don't have the right real estate there, then all this work can be for naught. Okay. Um, having a partner with a recent vasectomy, can vitamin and antioxidant therapy harm the sperm that has been exposed to the bloodstream before a reverse vasectomy? Hmm. I don't think so. I don't know the answer to the question. Okay. Should be fine. I mean, um, but, you know, it's, it's going to take three months to really see the results of a vasectomy reversal anyway. Whether or not anti-sperm antibodies form is, is pretty variable. Um, normally, it'll happen either at the time of the vasectomy itself or at the time of the reversal. There isn't a lot that you can do to prevent it. Got it. We've got a question here about your Zestica, which seems like a really great product. Um, do you know where you can literally go purchase that? Is it carried in particular drugstores? You know what? Um, patients tell me that it's easy to find. Um, we're going to be carrying it shortly um, in our office, but um, they say that of the sperm-friendly lubricants, it is the most widely available. So, you know, at a shoppers or something like that, you should be able to find it. Um, we'd like to make it available to patients through fertility clinics just because you know, I think there's still a stigma about going through fertility therapy and a lot of people prefer not to identify mm. uh, with it at the pharmacy counter. Um, so we're going to try to make it available to people through the clinic. But it's, it's, it's widely available and um, it's also available online, I believe. Okay, great. Perfect. It's fantastic wow. stuff though. Mm -hmm. Patients love it. Okay, awesome. Um, just a few more questions here. Is I'm gonna just spell this P Y C N O G E N O O L. Um, I synago no <laughs> antioxidant good, and I'm not sure if you've heard of that before. I get spell it one more time. Yes, P Y C N. O G E N O L. Pison Oginol. And I actually did learn Latin and Greek in university. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, unless it goes by a different name, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. I hadn't heard of it before either. Um, would parabens in, in the sperm friendly lubricant be harmful? So that I, I, I'm assuming that's other types of lubricants, parabens. Um, well, well, typically the, the sperm-friendly lubricants, um, you know, and, and Zestica is one that comes to mind. Pre-seed would be the other one. Um, they they enhance sperm motility. Mm. Um, the other ones, like a like a KY jelly or something, which I think has a high concentration of paraben in it, um, typically is not totally toxic to sperm, but they, they certainly, it, it impairs their motility. So I, I, if you're, if you're going to use a lubricant, um, I'd really look at the ones that have been researched and vouched for. Um, they're not that much more expensive. They're actually, you know, reasonably affordable. Um, the couples who use them uh, really like the consistency of them. And, uh, you know, I didn't get into all of the medical evidence on Zestica, um, but there is a, a lot of research that shows that it, it really helps sperm motility. And I think there's two questions that are mentioning pre-seed lubricant. Um, I'm assuming that's probably another brand. Have you heard of it? And one person's wondering if you'd be possibly carrying both or if you're really happy with, um, with the lubricant that you are recommending. 
Yeah, we are just going to carry Zestica um, just because, it, you know, the, the price point for patients seems to be a little bit better. Um, they're probably equivalent products, but the, um, the science behind Zestica is very strong. Um, Pre-seed, there, there has never been any issue with. Um, sometimes, I, you know, it has been hard for people to obtain sometimes, um, but both of them are, are excellent products. I really couldn't, you know, vouch for one versus the other. But as you've, have you, as you've seen throughout this webinar, a lot of the stuff that I do is just out of personal preference. Mm -hmm. And so I don't carry a lot of different products. I tend to find something that I'm comfortable with and, and stick with it. But it doesn't mean that the other products are inferior. It's just that we, we try not to confuse our patients by giving them, you know, Coke, Pepsi, and another type of cola. Like we just, we really um, try to give them a solid product that they can trust so that they don't have to worry about making yet another decision. Got it. And I think this is a really nice question to end off the webinar with. It ties back into the topic of the webinar for natural fertility treatments. Is there a benefit of following the natural fertility treatments for healthy, mature couples? that are 40 and over, at what point should you possibly not or not stick with natural fertility treatments and go directly to more aggressive treatments? I wouldn't say more aggressive, but if you're 40 and over, if you're not pregnant naturally within three to six months, I would go and get checked out, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, have some very basic investigations done. Talk to a doctor. I think a lot of people think that from the moment where they seek the help of a healthcare professional that they have sort of bought into that particular professional's brand of care mm -hmm. so that if you go to someone who's known for IVF you're going to get you're going to get IVF if you go to a naturopathic doctor you're going to get naturopathic treatment um, whatever branch of medicine we hail from we all start the same way and that's by asking questions and there's there's no harm in that um, if there's an obstacle to building your family, you should identify it, right? And, um, you know, trained professionals would be the best first step to start with. Perfect. And there was a few situational questions I'm sorry that I did not get to. Um, and, and I think, you know, what you just said rings true also for a lot of those situations. So, you know, if you do have more questions that are specific to your scenario, there's certainly lots of opportunities available for you to have those answered by a professional with experience. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I um, That's probably going to be all I'm going to be able to do today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, guys, once again, thank you so much for spending time with me. Um, I really do enjoy these webinars. Um, the guys from TBK Creative do an, an amazing job. Um, this is going to cap off our webinar series for the year. We won't be doing one in December because we know how busy people are. But, um, you know, we're going to fire up again in January. If there's any topics that you really want to address, um, you know, send us an email at info at fertilityontario.com. And um, we are always looking to talk about what patients want to talk about. So if there's something that um, we haven't broached in previous webinars or if you want an update on some of the previously available information, send us a line and we'll do our best to address it. Fantastic. Alrighty, well thank you for joining us everybody. Have an amazing holidays and hopefully we will see you all in the new year. Take okay, care. thanks so much. Have a great night everybody. Okay, take care.